Hello, everybody. Welcome to our today's data science seminar series. I'm so pleased we have here with us Professor Beza Najafi from Politecnico de Milano. He is with the Department of Energy and Politecnico, and his uh, area of research is the application of machine learning and AI for HVAC system, buildings, smart buildings, and then thermal systems. And yeah, the floor is yours, Beza. Thank you very much. So, uh, what do we want to talk about today? Firstly, just to give an give you an idea, we have I am coming from a, I don't know what that one was. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am coming from a mechanical slash energy engineering background. Uh, so we have been using uh let's say physics like a conventional physics based simulation since ever let's put it like that um though they have recently let's say uh in the last 10 15 years data driven models like machine learning based models specifically have had quite a hype let's put it like that and also they have uh, um, attracted a lot of uh, attention. It's not because they have been built in the last 10 years. The neural networks have been there for decades, let's say. But uh, that because the calculation cost has decreased and then the, the um, specifically for our application, the IoT devices have become much cheaper. This has become an available, uh, let's say, option for us, right? That, that it was not there um, like maybe 10 years ago, right? So what um, we have actually as a dilemma, that we already still have that physical simulation, but we also have the option of data-driven modeling, machine learning based modeling, for example, or deep learning, let's say. Um, and always, specifically deep learning has become fancy and fashionable in the last years. And uh, specifically when the PhD students start uh, uh, on their project, they always have this dilemma. Should I go there? I have heard the deep, I did just this Coursera course on deep learning, and then I did, I, mean, I know about machine learning. My friend uh, in another university did that. Uh, shouldn't I go with machine learning or deep learning, or should I still have physics based simulation? Recently, we also have a lot of hype on physics in four neural networks, right? Which is sort of incorporating physics in, in, in machine learning models. Uh, which one should I go for, right? That is, that's, that's, is the focus of this, um, uh, let's say, uh, seminar. So basically, we have this, like, I don't know, should I go there with this uh, physics-based simulation or I should go data-driven modeling? Somebody tells me that. So what I want to see are what are the aspects we should uh, consider. Yeah. You cannot see it on the audio, so that's strange. Oh, yeah. I'm sharing actually the presentation. Yes, that makes sense. Sorry. Is it fine now? Yeah, it should be. Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, uh, we don't know. Right? That's that's actually I've seen it specifically in academic side and also when uh, dealing with many companies, they have this dilemma because they've heard about it. Like manager have heard about it. Says, why don't you use machine learning, deep learning of that's cool, and that's uh, I've done. We we have hired just hired ten people in data science team. Why don't we? That's actually usually how the projects start. Why don't you do that, right? Uh, and that's actually what I want to um, discuss um, about. Uh, before before going to abstract problems, what I thought is that start instead of starting from this slide, I would go. Sorry, let me just go further. I start from a problem. And then I uh, go back to the slide. I think it gives you a better uh, perception of what I'm talking about. Uh, imagine that the problem is this. I want to decide when, so I am starting, I'm, that people are supposed to arrive here at eight o'clock in this room. Uh, and they have those two radiators there, a simple problem. Uh, I want to know when to turn them on. Right? That's, that's, that's as simple as that. Uh, so what commonly has been done in this 
the last 30, 40 years is like turning it on every room, every day at the same time. Usually, for example, who decides that? That guy that has the access to this BMS in this dirty mechanical room. So that's, that's how it works, right? And the decision is based on experience and feeling sometimes. Usually some they do, some I've heard it, I've seen it very different. Sometimes they do it at five o'clock. Sometimes they do it at three. Sometimes they do it at midnight. How do they do that? They start with two o'clock or something like that. Then they see if they receive calls in the morning. That's what how it usually used to do, it used to work like 10 years ago. And still there are plenty of buildings operating like that. They start with certain time, they see if they receive a call in the morning. If they don't, it's fine. That's that's how it works. Right. But of course, that's a very stupid idea to do that, right? Because you can see, for example, that this is one room, it's in a medical center in North Side Entry. And March 31st, it takes 15 minutes to heat it up from an existing in, in indoor temperature. On uh, January 17th, it takes 70 minutes. Right? So the, the duration is so it's just one single room, takes substantial different um, time to heat up them. Uh, um, let's say the room, right? And this is just one single room, if you can think about different rooms. So this is room A, the same day, 55 minutes, room a2 takes 15 minutes the same day, right? So we have variations in terms of the size of the rooms and the variations in outdoor temperature, right? So uh, the approach one might say is that, so if I don't have an intelligent system, what I do is that I choose the worst day, the worst room, and that's when I turn on everything. That's actually what that's calling system works, right? They find what is the worst case scenario in the worst day of the year, Let's say that the largest day room in this building on somewhere, I don't, I don't know when is the worst day in, 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 in Bergen, let's say January 20th, uh, takes uh, two hours or three hours. So since that day, that room takes three hours, I turn on the whole building at that time, right? I turn on at five o'clock. The problem is that's it's a very significant waste because you are, first of all, you are keeping on the, the heating system, the boiler and the heat pump turn on, a significant amount of thermal losses. And the buildings actually, like the rooms are warmed up way before the occupant arrives. And the result of that is that we have a significant loss. And it's not even linear. Those three hours is not linear. Specifically in Italy, we have a very cold, like very low temperatures in the early morning. So the signal, like it would be if you considered, it's not that it's just three hours, but these are three cold hours. Specifically, as I'm, I'm talking about that uh, medical center is close to Venice, and it really becomes cold in the winter and early morning. Right? Uh, you can see it also uh, better here. These are two rooms. This is how much the ramp up time changes by the starting indoor temperature, right? And that, of course, the starting indoor temperature when how much the temperature has reached, let's say at six o'clock depends on the day, right? And how cool it was outside, right? You can see it can be between, let's say 10 minutes to 35 minutes for those days. For the other larger rooms, it would be two hours, right? So the problem is that, uh, so we reached this point. We know it's stupidly managed. Now I need a solution, right? Uh, and now I go back to my uh, previous slide, and the first one, sorry. So now what I can choose is physics based uh, or data driven. It really depends on data availability. First of all, do I have, so somebody tells me, uh, tell me if these uh, pipelines, let's say if, if this could be improved, this five o'clock we are doing, is it good or we should change it? Then we have two options. Either they have already some BMS data for example, in Norway, almost every building of management, they had VMS data available. Right? In, in Italy, it's not really common. It really depends on, on type of building and how recently it has been updated that upgraded the heating system. Right? But say, let's say if there is no data available, then the simulation, physical simulation is on the way. But recently, it has become much cheaper to, me to do measurements for us. Right? The BMS are becoming way more um, frequently utilized. So, uh, if we have these measure parameters in our data, then we have the option of 
let's say, uh, in data driven. Right? Then uh, the second point is availability of information about the system. Uh, so let's now consider the scenario that we have the BMS data. Uh, so we know, like in the last six months, every single room, how long it took to reach the set point temperature, right? That's a very easy one. So I just check what was the starting time, five o'clock. How long did it take to reach 20 degrees, let's say. Uh, so basically by ramp up time, I meant the time from the starting point, you turn on the system, let's say the radiator, till it reached this expected set point. It, initially we have between 20 to 21 degrees, right? In, in winter. Uh, but the, the, the also, so the choice between the physical, physics space, so we have this, what, what do I mean by physics space? I, we have this building simulation software open source for decades, they have been utilized, in which you can build the geometry of the building and the physical characteristics of the wall, and you do the simulation to show like what is the behavior of it. So if I have the data, I, then I have this dilemma, should I use that software or should I use machine learning? And that's, that's the dilemma I want to work on. Uh, there you have, uh, depends on also the availability of information about the system. What do I mean about that? Do I know the characteristics of the walls and like how thick they are, what layers they have, and the whole geometry of all the rooms? And uh, uh, availability of information about the governing phenomena. What do I mean by that? Do I know all the equations that represent the thermal behavior of the room or not? Right? So either, first of all, the first one is ideas, governing phenomena, and then the, sec the second one is real equations. And finally, how do I want to use this model? In the sense that, am I going to use this as in real time, to do it every day, or I want to do just a potential assessment? Right? Uh, then we have the trick. So one guy, usually it works like that. One guy there is sitting there, has been using Open Studio or Energy Plus for years, says, of course, we go with the physical. Model. The other guy is more hyped, has, has done this machine learning courses recently, says, you know what, let's try uh, um, uh, with, with that one. And then the, the, the fight starts. And I want to show you the fight, right? So this fight is actually based on uh, implementation of polar scalability. And that's, I believe, that is the main like criteria to choose the approach, uh, because you need to see how long it takes. Like it's, I believe you can do use both of the approaches, but you should see how much you need to spend in terms of the developer or simulator cost. Right. So if I go with the physical approach, the problem with it is that I would uh, have. A significant, I would need a significant time to do this model. So you need to model, like create a geometric model of all the rooms of the building, all the layers of the walls of that building. Uh, and that would result in this, right? That the problem in our, the projects fail, not because of the calculation cost, not because of the IoT device, because these are cheap now, right? You can do like, you can do, we have, Maybe we have used Google Cloud our, in our systems. Maybe the billing is 20 euros a year, like what we, because we do the calculations on the edge, right? So it's not really significant uh, in terms of. So the problem is that you need to pay people to do that, right? And then that's, that's the real cost of the problem, right? So uh, if going for physical models, I really believe that if we find data driven approach that replaces this physical simulation, really can help us have an edge. And secondly, the problem is that why I, I am on the side of the guy with the data-driven model is that, uh, first of all, how much is the accuracy I will need? And um, if we have also uh, some sort of robustness, because what I think we need, and, and I'll show you that we actually need that, is that you need to run this model every day, right? So if that model is really heavy physical model, even if you spent a lot of money on developing it, it appears to be useless because you cannot run it in real time, right? Because it's not usually robust, it takes a lot of time, right? Um, and the point is that uh, then uh, one might ask, um, imagine I'm going to use data-driven models, right? You, you are on with that. Should I use, uh, 
a machine learning, simple machine learning random forest model, or should I use a very, let's say, a heavy deep neural network for that? Right? That's the second dilemma, right? So usually the, the, how it starts that you have this deep learning used for everything that is there, right? Every problem, they usually start with the, the most advanced uh, algorithm that is there, right? So I want to show you that actually for this case, I am instead um, on the side of simplifying, and then I will show you why, but using a simple machine learning is actually sufficient. Why? Because it using that in, increase achieved accuracy it's actually shows shown to be used to be actually useless to the main goal of the project. I'm going to talk about what I mean. Uh, so basically, what are the advantage of advantages of let's say our my data driven model? How do I advertise it? This is better because we have lower implementation costs, substantially lower implementation costs. It has very like relatively low calculation costs. I will show you how do we do that. And then we have much higher robustness because I can run that on the edge and I can run it also in, in real time, right? If I want to run a, a, a one simulation of Energy Plus software, it would take me half an hour, right? At least with a very hot, let's say, um, powerful computer, right? And then so, sometimes in our model, we use a Raspberry Pi. I mean, that's, that's even out of, um, like it's not even possible to think about it, right? So we have this relative low calculation cost that helps us. But the bad is that if I use physical models, I cannot extrapolate. What I mean is that I can use the models I'm going to talk about for interpolation. So what I mean is that the, that phenomenon should have occurred in historical data and not that I would want to like show like simulate a phenomena that I don't have the data on, right? So it's because not learning the physics. So that is the bad, I need to know that, right? And there is an ugly, the ugly is that we have worked on this area for decades, developing physical models, physical governing equations, and we are not using any of that if I go directly for data driven model, right? Right? The professors will tell me, like, you will study this for years, and that is, seems to be pointless, right? You are not using any of that. And secondly, that, that's the worst part, is that there is no way, it's a black box model I cannot interpret. There is no explainability, right? That's, that's actually a lot of discussion on explainability of um, data driven models. Uh, so, what I would suggest, that's actually the main focus of this presentation, is using this physics inspired. So, I am trying to mitigate, not completely resolve, mitigate the ugly. The bad remains there, and I need to know that. Uh, so no extrapolation capability, but it can be a good estimator through enhancing or enriching these machine learning based or slash deep learning based pipelines using a set of features that are inspired by the governing phenomenon. So I'm not in inserting the equation. That's, that's actually, I need to um, specify that I'm not inserting governing equations. I'm just generating features that are inspired from this governing physics, right? I will then show you some examples. So what I do is that I create a soup of features based on what I think would impact the duration of the ramp up, based on my idea of the physical phenomena. And then I do a feature select. So basically I do a feature selection and I choose which one of these was actually helping achieving an accuracy. Right? That, that, that's what I do as a second. What it gives me as an edge is that firstly, it substantially reduces the dimension of the problem. So it's much low, like a much lower dimensional model that, that helps it also to run it for the training and also for uh, inferring like to the prediction is much e better for us. Apart from that, it helps me understand the if the physics, the, if the mod and um, features that are chosen are physically interpretable. What I mean is that if I can use this to interpret why it is like that. Right. So that it's still black box, but a bit less. Right. It's not even like it's sort of a gray box. Let's say like that. So it helps me understand and it gives me a capability of validation 
does it make sense or not right that, that's that's usually when what we don't have in um, black box right? so of course in order to choose these features i don't use correlation but i use causation which is of course for uh, since many of you have machinery background you know what i mean right i'm not using the, the if those features are correlated but if they are actually causing uh, the accuracy uh, in uh so going back to our um basically problem um the decision we made for this building was not to use the physical model because that was practically impossible because we didn't have the geometry detailed geometry we didn't have the walls the walls layers uh but we had historical data uh so what we thought of was building these um uh, machine learning based pipelines uh we go as simple as that, linear regression, random forest, the simplest, most stupid algorithm, not the hyped ones. Uh, and then we're doing them, we are doing them feature selection and then choosing the best algorithm, let's say, um, best performing models and, and subset of features, right? Uh, we did it actually with two training approaches, one offline and the other one using sliding window. For the sliding window, we did it like 10 days and 20 days. Uh, as simple as that, that means from a scale learning force, that's, that's the development efforts that you make. And uh, we as features then, that's actually the part that I believe it contributes is that we, on, we, we are not inserting any equations, but based on our idea of how the, the room behaves thermally, we added like the starting indoor temperature, which is clear that we have, and for external conditions, we are using the external temperature, but we are also adding other features. And mainly they are the mean temperature of the buildings because it impacts the temperature of the walls, external temperature of the walls, and lagged parameters, right? And specifically the slope of temperature. Why do I use the slope? So before I turn on, how much was the temperature slope going down like between four o'clock and five o'clock, how much does the, te the temperature decrease per hour? Um, why what do I do that? Because it represents the losses without the activation of the heating, right? And also the HVAC supply. If I have the, we are, I'm sending the water from the boiler to this radiator. So I know I can measure the temperature at least, even if I don't have distribution measurements in the distribution system, I have the generation side. So I know what was the temperature of the boiler sent at that time. So using the historical data, what we did is that we did this for both cross-validation and then testing. Uh, and that these were the results. Interesting result was that the outdoor temperature is not chosen, uh, which seems strange. Like how can the outdoor temperature not even help in improving the accuracy of the model? And the reason is the slope. Because we had added the slope, if I add the slope, I'm indirectly and implicitly representing the losses. So I don't even need that. So here the advantage is not only I am reducing the calculation cost because I'm reducing the number of features, but I'm also reducing a sensor. That is actually what is what. So that's actually, this approach helps us a lot specifically for that because it helps us to reduce the sensors that could be represented by other sensors. So it would help me with reducing the cost of uh, instrumentation, right? Uh, and then uh, basically we did this uh, and, and we have some sort of uh, mean absolute errors. You can see that in terms of minutes, these are very low, right? They are talking about five, 13, 10, 13 minutes, right? Let, let's see, we just, I'm representing it here for different days with different uh, random forests and estimation by the nearest neighbors and so on and so forth. The blue ones are the real ones. You can see that they are not that bad. I choose the best one, choose the extra three, for example. And uh, the only concern is that now I have some model and has some error, but then the first thing that that guy sitting there that has been managing this plant for 10 years tells you is that, okay, you are doing this and you are. Um, deploying this models, let's say how it works. Firstly, I can build a model. 
every five minutes, it checks it for all the rooms. When the first room, it is close to that point that reaches the set point at eight o'clock, it turns on the boiler and the, the, the pumping system, and then uh, actually turns on the rooms one by one, right? Easy to implement, so because you already have a data science background in, in AUPI, I imagine. Um, we are running it on a Raspberry Pi. The calculation cost is it's not there. Okay. Um, but they tell me, okay, but you had an error there. You were talking about 10, 15 minutes. This means that sometimes it can, the room can have not reached that set point still before the person arrived, right? And that's what we call it underestimation, right? So what we said, the answer is that it's true, but we can measure it because we have the historical data. What we do is that actually we do this in the whole historical data. We find the maximum underestimation we can make Right, and then after, let's say, so we can let's say that that underestimation is fifteen minutes or twenty minutes maximum. Since there is, there are usually some outliers. I don't know. Somebody has left the window out or something like that, open or something like that. What we do is that we do sort of uh, removing some outliers. I'm using usually the percentile. We show that actually we can use ninety percent percentile. So. Considering the 90th percent percentile, removing a couple of outliers, what is the maximum underestimation you can make? And then we add that underestimation to all of the estimation. So let's say that that value is 10 minutes. I add those 10 minutes for all the rooms, right? And for all the uh, values every day. Uh, so you can see the results here. The blue ones are the real ones. The red ones are the estimation. And then we are adding this semi-conservative. This means adding, considering 90% percent percentile and adding this time. And these are the purple ones. You can see that the purple ones are very close to the blue ones and always higher. That's what we wanted. We do it on purpose. I want to have a certain range of safety, right? But, so these are, um, this is what is happening in, for that room, specific room of C1 in March. But the funny part is that we did all of these very, detailed five minutes and 10 minutes. And that was what it was working on in the last 15 years, it was always 140 minutes. You know what, that's why I'm saying that it's always too good to see the downstream use of that model. So working on using a deep learning model was a very stupid idea. From That's why we didn't do it, not because it was pointless. You know what I mean? I'm reaching five minutes of uh, estimation accurate, like difference estimation error, let's say. The saving margin is 140 minutes till minus, let's say, 40 maximum. So 100 minutes overall. Like that five minutes doesn't even matter. That's, that's what I'm talking about, right? That's usually happens when I have worked a lot of uh, um, energy management companies, they hire like 10 data scientists because some manager thought that is a very good idea. And they start with this project, they, spent two years on building very detailed uh, deep learning based model that are completely useless, you know, because they don't have the guy to tell them what the problem actually is, right? Um, actually, I, I will come back to this. I've had plenty of these incidents that, that, that that's actually is, is interesting to share. So basically, if we do this analysis and we find the saving window using the semi-conservative approach, on average on all the rooms, we have 80 minutes of uh, saving window, right? So more than one hour and something every day of the year, every day of the heating season, let's say, that it's, uh, it could be possibly turned off. Uh, but the, we did this plus some other interventions in that building. We, are, we have been deploying these models on their last three years. The saving opportunity we find is around 24% in the consumption of the heating system is heating system, right? using these sort of interventions. Right? Very simple, one single Raspberry Pi working on that building, nothing science fiction, let's say. But the saving mar margin is really, really significant. Um, but, uh, I am, um, okay, I'm, I should finish in two minutes, so I'm already on. So, uh, but there is a point. Do you think it makes sense to do it in Norway? there is a difference. 
Do you think it's meaningful to do the same thing in Norway? And why not? It's... I don't think it makes sense, but I leave the answer to you. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think it doesn't work in Norway? Because we don't have boilers. We have much electricity. Still, actually, we have now. We are working on plenty of uh, boiler base. Uh, they hide it. All the Minnesota is hide, but they have plenty of them. Let's say, but it works also in the, with heat pump systems the same. Why? Because uh, anyway, they, the rooms are managed the same way, even if they are fired by they, they are uh, addressed by uh, heat pump. But but there is a more Significant problem for Norwegian market. What is the problem? Electricity price. Exactly. The electricity price early morning is, is way higher than uh, the night, right? So it makes sense to actually do the heating before in Norway rather than putting it in last moment, right? So in Norway, you need to do this. That's what we did for another application. Uh, you need to precondition. So if you precondition in Norwegian uh, buildings, you can actually warm up the building earlier. So you increase the temperature and then you wait. But for doing that, we need to have a model. I just wanted to show you as an example, I'm not going to do this because there's no time with that, but we could use the same exact approach also there because I actually had one project on estimating how long it takes to do it because we need to do them um, basically together. Um, this is, uh, I want to, I had actually a couple of other sites, but I want to leave the discussion as a monodirectional.